Welcome to SEO Trends and Triumphs, a look back at 2023 and what to expect in 2024. I'm your host, Nicole Gotzelig, and joining me today is Lily Ray. Lily is the Senior Director of SEO and Organic Research at AMS, AMS and Digital, where she provides strategic leadership for the agency's SEO client programs. Born into a family of software engineers, web developers, and technical writers, Lily brings a strong technical background, performance-driven habits, and forward-thinking creativity to all the programs she oversees. Lily began her career in 2010 in a fast-paced startup environment and moved quickly into the agency world where she helped grow and establish an award-winning SEO department that delivered high-impact work for fast-growing list of clients, including Fortune 500 companies. Lily has worked across a variety of verticals with a focus on retail, e-commerce, and CPG sites. She loves diving into algorithm updates, assessing quality issues, and solving technical SEO mysteries. Moderating the QA for us today is Sean Potter. Sean Potter, in, in his current role, manages Hotjar's SEO organic search strategy, and he plays a key role in influencing and owning team OKRs and is responsible for ensuring they impact the full sign up flow from new visits to paid subscriptions. Sean has a key influence on both non-brand and branded organic search initiatives and is responsible for evangelizing SEO best practices throughout the company to impact Hotjar's broader growth. Let's give a warm welcome to Lily Ray. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. All righty, so we will dive right in. Awesome. Well, thank you for the lovely intro. Um, super excited to be here with you all today and with Hotjar. Uh, I'm Lily Ray, as we just discussed, and uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of new developments in SEO throughout this year, um, particularly SGE, which is Search Generative Experience on Google. Uh, we're going to talk about some EEAT developments. It stands for uh, Experience, Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness. We'll talk a little bit about mitigating some threats to SEO and to, to revenue with a lot of the latest devel developments in the SEO space. And then we will open it up to Q&A as well. So let's start by talking about SGE, uh, Search Generative Experience on Google. So for anybody who's unfamiliar, SGE is a new development on Google. <laughs> let's see if this plays. This is uh, the video from the Google Keynote in uh, Google I.O. in May. And essentially, this is when Google announced that they will be uh, experimenting with a new type of search result called SGE. This is Google's take on generative AI and clearly a response to things like um, OpenAI, ChatGPT, and a lot of demand from users and shareholders in terms of like, what's Google going to do with displaying AI directly in the search results? So we've learned that they are experimenting with SGE. Uh, we'll talk about how SGE has expanded throughout the year. Um, but if there's one thing we currently know about SGE that I want to start with and that I want to be very clear about is that nothing is certain with SGE. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this in the SEO space throughout the year. There's been a lot of people making um, hypotheses, a lot of predictions, a lot of like, oh, this is going to completely obliterate our organic traffic or cut into click-through rates or do all these different things. But for many of us who have been in the beta test for SGE for a very long time, I think I was granted access in maybe like uh, May or April or something. Uh, I think May, actually. Uh, it's It changes every single day. So we see SGE evolving, trying new things, turning on, turning off, not being available, being available every single day. It's something different. So I think it's still a little bit too early to predict how SGE is going to impact organic search. But this is basically the timeline of what we've seen with SGE throughout 2023. So in May of 2023 at the Google IO keynote, Google announces SGE. This was highly anticipated by a lot of us in the SEO space and a, a lot of us in the tech space and you know Google's audiences and shareholders and, and site owners and things like this, because obviously when Google starts to integrate uh, its AI capabilities directly into the search results, that has a lot of potential impacts on a lot of different things, you know, site owners, marketers, publishers, things like this. So that was highly anticipated, and I think a lot of us in the SEO space were particularly interested in how, if at all, uh, Google would choose to integrate links directly within SGE results. Um, for anybody that has played with ChatGPT throughout the year, 
obviously things are changing now, but I think when we first started using ChatGPT and a lot of these generative AI tools, uh, it was pretty clear that there's not a lot of sourcing happening in there. <laughs> the way that we're familiar with with organic search, where you get a lot of links to different places. So we'll talk about how that's evolved throughout the year. And in May or June, Google started to roll out SGE as a test uh, in Google Labs, particularly to US testers. So you could go into Google Labs, you could opt in. And for many people, not everybody, but a lot of people got that beta access to SGE. Um, I know throughout the year, a lot of people in different countries have not been able to uh, access it yet or experiment with it yet. To this day, it's actually technically still not available uh, in Europe to test uh, in Google Labs, but they have expanded that. Um, so first, you know, as Google's conducting these experiments and more and more people are testing SGE and more people are providing feedback, and of course they're monitoring how people are using SGE throughout the year, and also hearing from us, those of us who like to uh, raise a flag and provide Google with feedback about what we think, how we think SGE could improve, especially as it relates to um, protecting, you know, the content and uh, the traffic flowing to different websites on the internet. They did start to integrate things like, um, you know, internal linking within SGE or rather links to sites within SGE and a lot of different ways that they're displaying content, images and videos and things like this. Um, and recently, SGE has expanded to larger audiences around the world. So 120 plus countries currently have uh, beta access in Google Labs to SGE. They've also expanded it to teenagers. So they've, you know, I guess they're more confident that SGE is safer for younger audiences as well. And they've made some vague statements about when this may or may not become live. Uh, a lot of people think it will be live in 2024, but uh, we'll talk about the different things that Google has said throughout the year. So one thing that's been very interesting um, and maybe not entirely surprising is that uh, Sundar Pichai in particular, the CEO of Google, has uh, really kind of amplified uh, you know, SGE and the great work that they're doing, uh, particularly in talks with, with shareholders. Google has said um, SGE is a really clear quality win. We're getting a lot of great feedback from our users. We're seeing a lot of data that shows and indicates that uh, Google users that are experimenting with SGE are having quite a good experience. They think it's, you know, the quality of the results and the answers are above and beyond what they got before. And, you know, a lot of people have provided feedback as, as you would expect that there's some things broken, there's some things inaccurate, there's these shortcomings, which makes a lot of sense because that's the reason it's still in beta. Uh, but Sundar has basically communicated that he's very confident that uh, this product will get better over time. And this is absolutely true. It's something that we've seen throughout the year. It is getting better over time. I think the AI tools in general are getting better over time. So that's not entirely surprising, but it has been very interesting to see that uh, a lot of the shortcomings and uh, issues with SGE earlier on have actually been resolved quite well by Google. So. The media, of course, has uh, has had a pretty big reaction to SGE, both good and bad. Um, these are some of the headlines you might have seen this year when people talk about SGE. Um, I think one big takeaway and one big observation that is something that people talk about a lot in the publishing space is that, you know, um, SGE could cut into traffic flowing to publisher websites. So a lot of people are also concerned about plagiarism, you know, same with other generative AI tools. There's accuracy concerns. There's been uh, issues with the uh, answers that SGE provides and the safety and accuracy of those answers or the ethics of those answers as well. And I think within the SEO space and the marketing space, our biggest question is, you know, number one, how does this affect the traffic coming to my website? What does the click-through rate look like? Will people continue to click on links? Will Google continue to link to publishers? Um, and of course, the advertising and the monetization questions as well. You know, will Google show ads in there? Can Google make money off of this product? How will this impact traffic flowing to advertiser sites as well? So a, an important note, I think something that's worth talking about is that uh, despite the fact that Sundar um, almost like frames SGE as a very, like almost very confidently, like this is the future of search. And there's other things happening at Google, like uh, Gemini, for example, where Google is absolutely talking about new products that use AI to convey information in certain ways. Uh, Danny Sullivan, who's the search liaison at Google, a couple of weeks back at Brighton SEO and then uh, later online as well, specifically called SGE an experiment, which was interesting because experiment sounds a little bit different than something that we're launching <laughs> conclusively, you know, in the next three months or whatever. So 
it's still in its infancy. You know, we're listening to the feedback. We're still improving it. So I think hearing this type of communication from Google, at least for me, feels like um, they're still working on it. Obviously, they're still trying to get it right. And I think it's still a little bit too early to make um, conclusive statements about when this will launch, how it will impact SEO, uh, and how uh, how prevalent it will be in the search results. Because we're seeing throughout the year that a lot of queries that SGE used to uh, show up automatically, we're now either not seeing SGE or seeing different uh, formats where you have to kind of opt in to get an SGE answer as well. So that being said, how does SGE work? What does it look like? Um, I've been researching and speaking and writing about this a lot throughout the whole year. So I would say this is what I've seen uh, pretty consistently in terms of the categories that are impacted. I think it's pretty indisputable that informational content is the most impacted category, um, particularly things that are answered pretty easily, uh, things where there's kind of a general consensus. We're going to see things like SGE really uh, appear and potentially cut into traffic for those types of, of queries and that type of information. Review content is very interesting because uh, at the same time that Google's experimenting with SGE, there's absolutely a lot happening on the SEO side as it relates to sites that do reviews, both product reviews and reviews of people, places, and things, you know, any type of review content. Google has a new set of uh, algorithms, a new ranking system called the review system. Uh, in fact, there's a review system update rolling out right now that hasn't finished yet. I think a lot of people that publish uh, review content, travel content, and things like this are being impacted by those updates. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, SGE will often display, almost always display, uh, SGE results for queries that were previously reserved for a lot of these review type of sites. So if you say best running shoes for women, you're most likely going to see SGE appear with various different types of results. Um, with that said, uh, shopping and commerce queries as well. This to me seems like the biggest trend that I've seen in recent weeks and months with SGE. Almost always when you search something transactional, whether it's best running shoes or buy running shoes, you're going to see SGE. You're going to see a lot of links to Google's Merchant Center, uh, Google Shopping, you know, or a lot of different ways that they're displaying content from review sites as well. Also location and maps content. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, this has been pretty consistent throughout the year that Google really seems to be leveraging SGE as it relates to displaying uh, local businesses, uh, local services and travel content, best things to do in different cities and things like this. Uh, branded keywords, I've been pretty surprised to see that SGE will often appear for a lot of different branded keywords, and I'll show some examples later, but this has been something that's been turning on and off all year. Um, I think that Google's really trying to get it right, because obviously when you when you look at branded queries, there's a lot of uh, potential impact in terms of uh, advertising, right? People bid on their branded name and their competitors' names and things like this. So. I, don't, I know that Google obviously needs to monetize. They make money off ads. So I don't know that they would want to launch something that potentially cuts uh, significantly into re ad revenue for them. Talked about travel content, um, health and wellness queries. I'll talk about this as well. Um, it's interesting that what Google kind of suggested that how SGE would work or not work as it relates to health and wellness queries is a little bit different than what we're actually seeing out in the wild and many more. These are just the high level uh, categories that I think will be impacted, but this is absolutely not a comprehensive list. There's a lot of other categories that can and will be impacted if SGE rolls out. So uh, in the beginning of SGE launching, at least in beta, uh, there were really not a lot of links. We had uh, these, these kind of like three upper right uh, thumbnail links or sometimes more than three. And on mobile, it was often at the bottom of the result. You could kind of scroll through this uh, these little thumbnails that point to the places where Google got the information. But in the beginning, we didn't see these drop down links the way we are now. Um, it was probably about four or five months ago that Google really started to experiment with incorporating more links directly into answers, which is really good, obviously, for those of us that care about SEO and traffic. Uh, we don't know how much people will click on these links. We don't know click through rates. We don't have data in Search Console. We don't really have a lot of evidence or indication that anybody will click on these. There's been some murmurs that people actually do. Um, I know with Bing Chat, they've had these types of links and annotations the whole time. And then there's some positive signals there where they're, they're actually seeing people clicking on those links. Um, but with Google, we still don't exactly know. So anybody that's trying to project, you know, click through rates, losses in traffic, things like this, it's just it's just too early to tell. We don't exactly have the data. So just keep that in mind. And uh, you'll also see Google experimenting with different types of, of links throughout the answers all the time. And an error exists. 
ignore that. Um, so this is what I mentioned before about transactional queries. So when you say best values, for example, uh, you can see that there's uh, basically this new, this was yesterday. So this new type of SGE format where they're blending, uh, first of all, it says the hiking shoes, this information came from Google's brands and stores. Whenever you see that, that's essentially Google saying, we got this information from Google Shopping or Google's Merchant Center. They do this a lot. It's not just Google's Merchant Center. They'll they'll get information from things like Google's Knowledge Graph or Google Books or Google Scholar or these different data sources that Google has of its own information. And it'll actually cite that as the source directly in SGE. Um, but this is a blended result where you're, you're going to see some information coming from Google brands and stores, some information coming from um, product review sites or or blogger or you know informational websites, trending brands. That's a new development that I'm seeing in SGE. And then these here are links directly to uh, Google Shopping. So they're testing all kinds of different blended and mixed results in SGE. But I will say a big takeaway, a big trend is there's more and more links directly to Google Shopping to products in there. Next page. Okay. So what Google says and does, does with SGE, we've seen throughout the year, are often very different things. Google might communicate, we want SGE to do this. We don't want SGE to do this. And then those of us that are playing with it all the time, we'll see uh, it's actually doing something completely different. Uh, I think that's kind of expected with AI. You can't really control everything that it does. But in 2023, when Google announced SGE, they said that uh, basically a lot of the same type of communication that we've heard them say with different announcements throughout the years as it relates to uh, what we call like your money, your life queries, uh, things that affect, can have the potential to impact a user's uh, safety, security, health, well-being. These are called your money, your life queries and topics. And this is very consistent with Google talking about, you know, we don't want to provide um, bad information, dangerous information for things like medical queries, right? So SGE won't show, for example, when you ask a question about giving Tylenol to a child because it's in the medical space. Google might not also show answers to questions in the financial space. And what they also said here is our ranking systems are designed to not unexpectedly shock or offend people with content that could be harmful or hateful or explicit. SGE is also designed to not do that. And I believe them. I think that they're really trying to get this right. But what we've seen throughout the year is uh, it, SGE has done just this many, many times. <laughs> uh, they're getting better at it. But, you know, in the beginning when Google said we're not going to show SGE when you ask about giving Tylenol to a child, granted, this doesn't say Tylenol, it says cough medicine, but um, SGE definitely appears. And they really do try to say, listen, this is not... Um, this is not official medical information. This is not medical advice. This is not legal advice or financial advice, but here's what basically we can summarize from a lot of the different results that we're seeing in Google. Uh, it does show. And you know, when Google said in the beginning, we, we won't show it for medical queries, we won't, won't show it for financial queries. It's absolutely showing for lots of medical and financial queries. Uh, this was something that my coworker Alec found. Uh, we were doing a bit of digging to basically like see if we could find um, potentially dangerous content in SGE. And he knows a lot about mushrooms. I guess this is a poisonous type of mushroom. And when you ask how to cook it, SGE was providing cooking advice for that mushroom. You're probably not going to find this now. So as expected, you know, we're testing SGE. It will get things wrong. So generally speaking, I don't think you'll see this type of answer for SGE, but that's not to say that there aren't other potentially dangerous queries that SGE will appear for. So I think this is a really big challenge for Google. Um, I cannot imagine getting it right every single time. I have a feeling that it's impossible to do that, but I don't, maybe, maybe not. Um, but even if it gets like 1% or less than 1% of queries like this wrong, I think that that's a really big concern and a really big risk for them. So similarly, uh, something that I've noticed throughout the year is how SGE treats branded content or like navigational searches. So when you're specifically trying to go to a, a specific website or a specific brand or a specific tool on Google, like Google Search Console, I type Google Search Console into Google and none of the links, in this case, this was back in August, but none of the links that SGE pulled from were the Search Console homepage. It was like, Google talking about Search Console, different people talking about Search Console, what it does, different links to all these different places, and none of them were the Search Console homepage. 
And all I typed was search console. So that's a navigational query. That means that I'm using search engines to try to get to a specific place. Um, and Danny from Google actually responded when I tweeted about this and said, like, number one, did that auto, auto generate for you? Because we probably don't want SGE to like auto generate when somebody's typing a branded keyword. Uh, maybe we give them the option to learn about search console from like an informational perspective. Uh, but for navigational queries, like Google knows that people are really just trying to get to a specific website. So in August, um, this is what Barry Schwartz wrote about in Search Engine uh, Roundtable, basically just kind of like deducing like SGE shouldn't trigger automatically when people type branded queries. Um, I don't think that this is what we're still seeing in the wild. I think we're seeing a lot of SGE uh, trigger for a lot of different branded queries, a lot of navigational queries. So this was uh, Black Friday and I typed Tech Radar Nintendo um, OLED. I think that's how you say it. I don't have one. Um, but basically, none of the links go to TechRadar. So this was a lot of different people talking about the console, talking about the pros and cons. But, you know, I specifically typed TechRadar. So I personally think this was not a great result just because um, when you type a brand name, you're probably trying to get to that brand site. And I also think it's not a great look to take a branded keyword and show other links. I mean, we'll, we'll see how users actually end up experiencing this and whether or not they like it. But um, Aleda, wonderful SEO and friend, she she responded to when I tweeted about this and said similar things happening for other branded queries. So if you look at like Nike Air Max for women, there are some links to Nike, but you're going to see a lot of different links to a lot of different people that are selling in Google's uh, Google Shopping. So this is absolutely something to pay attention to if you are an e-commerce site, if you're a product review site, even for brands, right? So if you're tech radar, I can imagine that you would want to know when somebody's typing a tech radar branded query that SGE is potentially showing uh, links to a lot of different sites that are not tech radar. It'll be very difficult for us to track this unless we have this type of data in our search console, which we currently don't. But this is something to pay attention to and try to get ahead of, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I mentioned before that SGE is often opt in now. So, you know, in the past, in the beginning of SGE being tested, you would see a lot more of it, um, appearing automatically. And in some cases, like taking over the entire screen, SGE is often now opt in. So you'll see a lot more of this, like get an AI powered overview for this search. This is not 100% true. Um, you know, different people are seeing different things. Some people see it, it appear a lot automatically. Some people are not seeing it at all, despite having SGE enabled. But I'm seeing more and more of this. Um, and others like Glenn Gabe are seeing the same thing. So uh, I think what they're doing is they are maybe reducing the amount of uh, SGE results that get generated just because it's very expensive for Google. That part is not uh, that's something that's clear across the board for generative AI. It's quite expensive to operate. And maybe they're just seeing um, if they make SGE opt-in, are people continuing to have a good experience with it? Is this something that people really want to use? Um, me personally, just my own opinion, I would love for SGE to mostly always be opt-in. I think that it does a lot of really cool things, but I don't love as much the experience when it takes over the full screen. But that's just my own opinion. This is new as well. Um, SGE can now drop pictures. I don't know if anybody finds this uh, helpful or useful. I think there's some really cool stuff you can do here. Uh, sometimes I forget that like these generative AI tools now have a lot of built-in image functionality and, and ability to create pictures. I think like if you're someone like me that builds decks all day, decks all day, <laughs> sometimes it can be helpful to say like I need a picture of an Australian shepherd frolicking through a field, um, and SGE can do that pretty quickly. So that's pretty cool as well. And big impacts on Google Maps and local businesses. So this is something that's been true throughout uh, the year of testing SGE. It almost always appears for uh, localized queries. So if you type best coffee shops in Brooklyn, you will see a lot of SGE results. Uh, Google's been experimenting with the, the way that this looks throughout the year. And the thing that I think is most interesting about this is number one, um, it's not always going to be a direct replica of what you see when you scroll down further on Google and you see Google Maps. So Google Maps obviously has its own uh, ranking system. You know, they they look at uh, keywords in the title of the brand name. They look at description. They look at pro obviously proximity is extremely important. But what you're seeing with SGE is that um, it does different things like this: best chai latte, best espresso, um, and then if you look at the links, so this little drop down here. Uh, it's basically taking what Google has seen across the internet about, let's say, Absolute Coffee in Borum Hill, 
and they're uh, almost like consolidating and summarizing the things that people have said about that coffee shop. So SGE is taking other people's insights uh, and other people's reviews and using that to choose what types of local businesses appear in the SGE result. So it's not just about proximity, it's actually about what other people have said, which I think is very interesting. So it's more qualitative, it's drawing more from uh, other people's perspectives, which is a big trend that we'll talk about on Google. And another one, so Giorgio's NYC, my teammates and I actually had dinner here last night. Um, but something I thought was very interesting is that, um, you know, before you would see Google Maps or Google Business Profile and you'd see uh, Google displaying in most cases, what the business owner has submitted as far as like name, address, phone number, maybe pictures that they've submitted and that users have submitted. But in this case, uh, Google is piecing together information about the uh, business itself and displaying that information directly in SGE. So if you're somebody that, you know, does like call tracking or, you know, it looks at website clicks coming from Google Maps and Google Business Profile, this could cut into it quite a lot. We won't necessarily know that somebody got that phone number off of SGE. So it could make tracking and attribution even more challenging, which has been a big trend in the last couple of years. And a big question with SGE is how will Google monetize it? I know Glenn Gabe's great SEO. He's been he's been asking this question. A lot of us have been asking this question all year. SGE is super cool, but like if it costs Google a lot of money and it's hard for them to integrate links or to integrate ads directly into SGE, how will it be profitable for them? How will they monetize it? And he's seen some tests in the wild where um, there's sponsored results directly in SGE results now. Google has told us this is where they're gonna go. They're going to start experimenting with placing ads in different places within SGE, but it will be very interesting to see whether or not people click on those ads and whether that continues to be as profitable as uh, Google ads currently are for them. Google also launched some new updates to Chrome um, that relate to SGE and generative AI this year as well. So this one's called SGE while browsing. You can enable this in Google Labs as well. And basically when you're in Chrome, you can hit, uh, it looks like a little Chrome extension, like a, a plugin in the upper right. It'll create this sidebar um, or in mobile, it'll kind of pop up and take over your whole device. And it'll use generative AI to tell you some key points about the page. So it'll say, First, it does an interesting thing where it basically creates its own, like almost like FAQs or jump links, table of contents. That's using generative AI. So explore on the page is not just pulling, you know, your H2s, your H3s or different headlines on the page. It's actually taking the content on the page, summarizing it, creating these links where it's going to jump you to different questions that it thinks are relevant on that page. And it's going to create its own FAQs as well. So based on the content on the page, it creates its own FAQ section that you can navigate directly in Google Chrome. As you can see here, this whole experience is, it's on Google, it's in Chrome, it's not on your website. So you can hop around in here and learn insights about the page that they use to generate with AI that are not necessarily looking directly at your page. Um, there's also this other feature where if you click on about this page on the right side, it's going to pull in information that Google has about the source. This is something they've been pushing for the last couple of years. They're trying to get information about a brand or about a source that they can basically show directly in um, Google's results. So there's a lot happening here. I think for brands, this is just my own opinion. Um, SGE feels to me like it's often a little bit unfinished and sometimes inaccurate. Uh, this is a skincare company that I love to buy their products and I searched for their name. This was a branded keyword. And what Google told me is you can buy their Paula's Choice products at uh, lacarenes.com. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, Durham store and Walmart. And uh, it didn't mention paulaschoice.com. You know, they have their own website where they sell their products. And for whatever reason, SGE did not mention that first and foremost. Also, this website here, La Carenes, is uh, an Indian site, and it only ships to India, and I'm searching in the US, so that's not super helpful. Um, I've seen a lot of different international information get pulled into SGE in the US, and I think that that's a challenge that Google needs to look at, because not having your website appear for branded queries is not great for e-commerce websites. Um, next, SGE can connect the dots between entities and their social media accounts. I think this is very interesting. I've been playing a lot with my own name and my own website this year as far as what SGE shows. Um, I, I built some content on my website about my favorite cities, for example. And I think it's very interesting that number one, Google is pulling the information from my website about my favorite cities. But then beyond that, it actually knows who my uh, who I am on Twitter and X and Twitter, aka X, um, LinkedIn, different social media profiles, even Instagram. And if I said something on X, 
for example, um, I'm in my home city of San Francisco uh, because I asked, what are my favorite cities? It says uh, San Francisco is Lily's home city. So it made the connection that that's my ex account and it looked at my tweets, exes, whatever they're called now, and it actually knows that that's my home city. So this is kind of mind boggling because this means that anything that you say, your brand says, your creators say on social is something that could potentially get pulled into SGE as like a detail or uh, an opinion about that person, for example. So all year I've been playing with this. I created an about page on my website where I actually just um, put some basic information about myself and then asked questions very, very clearly and uh, answered them very, very clearly for SG. And you can do things like, you know, encouraging crawling and indexing, of course, on Google and Bing. You can use index now for rapid indexing on Bing. You can make sure the content's crawled by Google, really just kind of get it out there, get it in search engines. You can use structured data, like person structured data or organization structured data and give search engines a lot more information directly about yourself or your brands. And you can actually influence what appears in SGE. This happened pretty quickly for me. So I just put some random questions that haven't been answered online before. What is, who's my dad and what did he do for work? And it very, very clearly shows this information on SGE now, whenever I ask that question. And it's gonna use that about page as the source. Um, how is Lily Ray related to Man Ray? This was a, a, my great grand uncle. So I put that on my website and it's also pulling that page directly on my website. And it's basically taking like a lot more information about me and kind of like spinning that up there as well. So I would recommend doing this if you care about your personal brand, your company, you know, your website, uh, try to get ahead of any possible question people might have about you by adding this content directly to your website. And this is funny. I think, uh, you know, AI tools can still be a bit confused by certain uh, nuances of human language. So uh, one of the questions I put on my website is, does Lily Ray have a dog? SGE is actually doing a really good job of consistently saying, yeah, she has a dog. Um, it even mentioned uh, this tweet where I talked about celebrating my dog's eighth birthday. <laughs> it's like she also just celebrated her dog's eighth birthday. Um, but then this is a funny one. So I, in an interview at one point, I said, uh, growing up, we had a dog named Java. And SGE said growing up, you know, Lily had a dog named Java and that Java taught her and her brother a lot about the Internet. Not exactly true. It was actually my dad that taught us a lot about the Internet, but SGE got very confused by this word she. So this was an innocent example, but it kind of is a good example of how AI can often um, misinterpret one little tiny detail that can kind of change the entire meaning of the answer. So that's something to pay attention to. So next is uh, EEAT. So the rise of experience throughout 2023. EAT stands for Experience, Expertise, Authority, and Trust. Last year in 2022, Google officially announced that there's this new E for experience that they're using um, in this whole concept. So for anybody that's unfamiliar, this is something that comes from Google search quality guidelines. It's something that they use to train Google's uh, human search quality evaluators. And what they say is that for a lot of different types of content, a lot of websites, um, we really, we need you to focus on this whole concept of EEAT. Trust is at the center of the family. We really need users to be able to trust this content. But then the expertise, authoritativeness, and experience of the people producing that content, of the website that that uh, content lives on, that all factors into basically how high quality that content can be. And what Google's been cracking down on this year is particularly uh, that E for experience. So it started with product review content, uh, a Basically, one or two years ago, Google started to crack down on review content that lacks firsthand experience. And what they did is they then expanded that product review update into all review content. So now it's called the reviews update. And a lot of travel sites, a lot of bloggers, a lot of people who have published content where Google doesn't have a lot of evidence of firsthand experience, things like... Uh, I'm a travel blogger and I went to Mexico City and here's a picture of me in Mexico City and here's all the food that I tried and pictures of that food and my personal opinions about that food. If you're not writing content like travel content in this way, in this way that demonstrates real firsthand experience, we're seeing a lot of sites lose a lot of visibility on Google right now. So generic content that doesn't prove that you've actually been to the place or reviewed that product is something that people are very much struggling with in SEO nowadays. Um, concurrently, they are launching what they call the hidden gems update. So they're promoting firsthand experience algorithmically in the search results. They mentioned this about maybe six months ago that they were going to start doing more of this. Um, and we learned about two weeks ago that this update's actually been live for a month. 
Um, this is not a secret now, but a lot of people are seeing that Reddit is everywhere in Google search. And this is what the visibility of Reddit looks like throughout the year. Not just them, many different types of uh, forums, which I'll jump to here. Um, Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange, Quora, we're seeing a lot more of these uh, sites ranking in Google's organic search results, including an SGE. So an SGE, you get um, answers directly being pulled from uh, Reddit you get discussions and forums, which is a new type of SERP feature. You get a lot of Reddit answers directly in the search results. And this is likely a result of Google trying to elevate what they're calling hidden gems, uh, which is people who have talked about something in a forum or in comments, uh, have elevating that content because it really shows that firsthand experience. This is a new one, kind of brand new. There appears to be some unintended consequences of hidden gems. Um, it's hard to say whether or not that's exactly what's causing it, but this is a groups.google.com subdomain on Google where there's a lot of uh, user-generated content and forum content that happens to contain a lot of dangerous, illegal, controversial content. And in the past couple of days that's been surging, he might see groups.google.com ranking in top position. So I think they still have some work to do as far as regulating the quality of content of what gets to rank in top positions. They've also launched new structured data for forums and profile pages. So you can actually use a specific markup like profile page markup to encourage your site to appear in more of these different types of uh, SERP features for discussions and forums. Google's also highlighting authors and social media metrics. So they've confirmed that this isn't necessarily connected to Google's knowledge graph. It's just a way of them um, putting a nice result, a nice rich feature directly in the search results that shows um, different author names for things like different perspectives on Google. They're also putting follower accounts, which I think is a pretty bold move, but you can now see social media follower accounts for, for online creators and publishers in many cases directly in Google's results. They're experimenting with off, um, article carousels for different authors. If you type an author's name and that's a well-known author on Google, you might see this carousel for different content that they've published published. Um, and in some cases, you'll see like, again, the social media uh, counts and uh, engagement for those articles as well. So I think they're really trying to elevate and highlight uh, reputable authors in Google. I mentioned before about the source, they're doing more with uh, ways for users to be able to understand who a brand is. So directly in the search results, you can click three dots, learn more about a brand like Hotjar, learn what third party reviews have said about that brand, or you can learn directly about the author who has contributed to that article as well. So this is absolutely a manifestation of uh, EEAT directly in Google search results. We also see Google perspectives. So there's different perspectives on different topics. You can see a lot of different uh, ways that Google's displaying this content, trying to get different uh, thoughts and different opinions from different content creators. And they're definitely um, experimenting with a new filter that you can actually click perspectives directly on Google. And you can see things like YouTube shorts, TikTok, Reddit, uh, different forums. And I believe that this is their effort to try to elevate firsthand experience and authentic results because at the end of the day, authentic results and firsthand experience are essentially the opposite of um, bland, AI-generated, spammy content. So this is absolutely the direction that Google seems to be going these days. And um, they're also experimenting with notes. So now in labs, you can enable this feature to add notes to different types of search results. Um, I think this is a pretty bold move as well. Um, people can potentially leave some user-generated content directly on Google. We'll see what happens with this. I think this will be interesting to see how that plays out. So real quick, mitigating the threat to uh, SEO. There's a lot happening here. Um, and I know that a lot of people are having a really hard time right now. I have never in my 14 year SEO career heard as many complaints and concerns from site owners, frankly, as I have in the last few weeks and months. It's been a very, very hard year for SEO. So diversify, that's my main takeaway. My main recommendation is to think about SEO beyond just the 10 blue links. Think about video. Uh, Google is highlighting, especially YouTube video, all over the place in Google Discover, in the video tab, in Google search results. I know that today they just made some announcements about um, whether or not pages will be eligible for a lot of these different types of features, but I absolutely encourage you to think about developing a video strategy for your sites if you don't already have one. Um, expanding internationally, sometimes SEO can be easier in other countries other than like US English speaking countries, for example. Um, if you expand into Latin America, or you've been into Portuguese or things like this, you might see that there's a lot of people who want to read your content, but you just need to kind of do that work to uh, translate that content, set up your international setup on your site, um, but you can get a lot more traffic and visibility that way as well.
Images are, of course, super important. Uh, Google likes to push, especially for products, very, very high quality images. This is very important for Google Discover as well. So really think about your image strategy. If you do care about Discover, um, think about not only having an image that meets the criteria that they're looking for in terms of sizing, but that you can also create very engaging uh, images that maybe you edit them specifically for Google Discover. We're seeing very good click-through rates from that. Um, optimize and further improve what you already have. You know, a lot of SEO people for the past few years have thought about just like churning out as much content as possible. I would encourage you to think more about taking what you already have and optimizing it, updating it, um, maybe going back to content that's two or three years old and updating it using tools like Hotjar to see how people interact with it um, and not just continuing to produce lots of content because that's what's getting uh, a lot of sites into a little bit of SEO trouble in the past few months. Of course, Reels, TikToks, and short videos. So not just long format videos on YouTube, but of course, think about people are starting searches on TikTok. Obviously, Reels are very trendy on things like Instagram. Um, Google even has things like uh, web stories directly on Google or short videos on YouTube. So formatting uh, visual content in different ways. Podcasts are a big one as well. You can do interviews. You can start your own podcast. You can join other people's podcasts. Uh, that type of content can do very well. And then you can think about SEO in a different way. For example, you can try to get your content, your podcast to appear higher on um, Spotify, for example, or SoundCloud, things like this. Always focus on EEAT. That's my biggest recommendation for the last few years. Really think about building your people, building your brand, making them very reputable people on Google. Um, try to get your authors and your brands into Google's knowledge graph. You can use structured data. You can get third-party citations. Things like this really, really help your brand to appear there. And generally speaking, this really does lead to better SEO performance. Think about Google Discover. Um, DM me at some point if you want to talk about it. I'm obsessed with Google Discover. Our team does a lot of Discover consulting, but uh, this is a way that people are getting a lot more organic traffic than uh, they used to. And it's challenging. It's volatile, but this is a great uh, medium for a lot of different publishers and content creators as well. Perspectives. Um, think about how you can leverage the people that work at your company to share different perspectives and maybe document those on short videos and have a repository of opinions on your website, for example. And think about SGE and Bing Chat. So the more that you can experiment with how your brand and your people look in those features, really try to get ahead of controlling the narrative there. Because if and when Google launches SGE, you are absolutely going to want your brand to appear well in SGE as well as Bing Chat. So thank you so much for joining us. And we will now open it up to questions. Hey, Lenny, thanks for the awesome presentation. Hey, everyone as well. Um, we've had some hey, loads. Sean, actually. Ah, um, follows me. Sorry, one second. Should I to maybe start to read some of the questions, Sean, while you're looking for that? Was that, yeah, good idea. I, I don't know if anybody else can hear Sean, but I can't hear Sean. Um, you can hear Sean? <laughs> I'll try to read lips. Uh, like maybe I will change my settings. Let's see. Try this. Any luck? Turn up volume. Should I now, Sean, maybe? Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Awesome. Yeah, I can hear Sorry you. about don't that. Worry. Always something. Always something. That's no, all right. Don't worry. I, I was trying to work out if it was as well. It's all good. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, we've had loads of great questions coming through, so I'll just jump straight into them. So first one is, have you started to prepare your clients for SGE? And if yes, what steps can people start to implement to get ahead of the curve? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Number one, it's very important to talk to your clients about SGE and maybe talk about some of the things that we went over today in terms of like how feasible it is, what we know, you know, what we don't know, how it's changing. So a lot of clients can start panicking when they learn about this for good reason. But I think that just uh, like kind of tempering, you know, like just being very realistic about expectations of what may or may not happen is a good starting point and keeping them abreast of developments and changes in SGE. So People like Barry Schwartz on Search Engine Roundtable are reporting on SGE changes nearly daily. So I would try to stay on top of those and communicate those with clients. 
um, what I showed before about like navigational search, for example, I would basically take a set of questions, like almost like people also ask, or you can use also ask.com, which is a fantastic tool. And you can source all the different questions that people are asking about your brand and your products and services, and just try to document what that's looking like over time and, and relay that to your clients. Just try to get ahead of controlling the message there. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, next one. Uh, what's your take on how B2B SaaS companies in the tech space will be affected by SGE? Um, B2B tech space in particular has seen interesting features whilst SGE was rolling out. Yeah, I mean, uh, luckily they can't really take your product away from you, right? <laughs> or a lot of sites that get like ad revenue, you know, they make money off ads. It's a it's a more of an existential crisis what SGE could potentially do for uh playing content from your website. But I think with B2B SaaS companies, if anything, um, Google might display some of the information that comes from your blogs or your resource centers or your PDFs or things like this in SGE. So in that sense, um, you want to make sure that what they're saying about your brand and your product is good and, and accurate. But uh, hopefully, luckily, people will still need to go to your website to get whatever it is that you are offering customers. So I don't think it'll be as much of a potentially negative impact for those types of companies, but I would really, really pay attention to um, how SGE displays information about your brand. For sure, that's awesome, my uh, Okay, next one, I'm just bring them out. So we often discuss how brands can or need to adapt to SGE, but what about users? What do you think about the impact of SGE on the search experience for people? Huh, yeah. Um, I've been curious about this all year. Um, I will say SGE has gotten exponentially better, which is what you would expect with an AI product. They get gen they get exponentially better all the time. So uh, I'm pretty impressed lately with some of the ways that SGE answers questions, but that's not to say that it doesn't still get things wrong. Even little nuanced things like saying that my dog taught me about the internet, um, you know, that's funny, but like, what are all the other examples where it's not funny and it's still wrong? So I think and I anticipate that not a lot of not every Google user is going to love this thing. I think that's the nature of Google. Um, Google experiments with things, it tests things, and there's always a lot of pushback to different types of features or there's always somebody who finds something that's wrong. So they're going to continue to make it better. That's what Google's always done. But I actually personally anticipate that if it launches like anything in its current form, there's going to be some level of uh, problems for them and some pushback. And I think people don't always love AI answers either. So they might want things to go back to the way that they were before. Yeah, for sure. That does tend to be a way sometimes, uh, but thank you for the answer. Um, okay. Could these changes lead to people and brands seeking and providing answers on different platforms and communities? Have you noticed any trends in this regard so far, e.g. TikTok, Discourse, YouTube, Reddit, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, absolutely. This has been another big development this year. Um, it's not a secret. You know, Google's even shared it, shared the numbers themselves. Like a certain percentage of their users, particularly younger users, are starting searches on TikTok. And the whole discussion about Reddit, I mean, the what Google's doing with Reddit appears to be a response to the feedback that they've gotten for the last few years. And obviously the data that they have from actual searches that people want Reddit. Um, a lot of people want Reddit. And if you think about it, why do people want Reddit? Number one, it's important to to clarify that a lot of people use Google uh, as a search engine when a website's own internal search is not great. So a lot of people are probably using Google to find something on Reddit because they couldn't find it by using Reddit's own search engine. That's one use case. But also, if everyone's appending Reddit to their searches, it's likely because they think Reddit's more authentic. They think they can get real uh, experiences, real opinions from real people. So um, a lot of people are going directly to Reddit or using Google to get directly to Reddit. So I think that that's a big challenge for Google. And I think that's what they're trying to combat, um, you know, introducing things like perspectives and, and notes and making uh, Google a little bit more social in nature. They're trying to combat it in that way. Sure. I love that take as well. Like it makes total sense to people not being able to find stuff on site and go to Google as a, as a second port call. Um, okay. Uh, we've got one here related to new sites. So what are the five might be a, might be a push to get make you do five on the spot, but what are the key aspects that we should prioritize an SEO for a new site? I do five, I do twenty. <laughs> I do <the> <laughs> I work in news SEO all day. Um, okay, five. Um, obviously timeliness. That's probably the most important factor in news. Although, um, get things right as much as possible. So if you can publish something, uh, maybe build on it later. Uh, but you need to get it out at the right time. It's going to be very important. 
Um, headlines are very important. You know, Google News and Top Stories and Discover use different fields than, let's say, title tags in organic search. So think about your H1s, think about your OG titles, think about your headlines and structured data. Uh, that's another big one, structured data. So, you know, news article schema, blog posting schema, whatever it is that you choose, you need to have good structured data, good sitemaps, news sitemaps. Um, number four, publisher center, make sure you're set up there. This is a debated one. People say, oh, it doesn't do anything. It does do something, I promise you. If you set yourself up in Google Publisher Center, you, you tend to see more news traffic over time. Um, and, and fifth, uh, images. Have good images, especially for Google Discover. Uh, Google likes to uh, display high quality, large scale thumbnails for news and top stories and Discover. So pay attention to your images. Awesome. Thank you. Great tips. Uh... Do we have any results or indications of OSG is performing in other languages? Does it translate content or localized by language? That's a good question. Um, I believe it's the latter. I'm not 100% confident. I mean, I think what's what they're doing is a version of what they're doing in US English results. So they're taking the index that they have in that country and that language and using SGE on top of that. Um, I don't know how it's doing in other languages. We don't have a lot of data so far, but I've seen anecdotally that people that speak other languages will find a lot of problems in SGE. Um, I think that generally speaking, Google tends to innovate more quickly and have more advanced features in the US for obvious reasons. They're based here, um, but it can sometimes, it seems like sometimes their technology is not as advanced in other languages. So that could pose additional problems for them in other languages for SGE, not to mention the issues that they have uh, from a legal perspective in places like all of Europe as well. That's really interesting insight. Thank you, Lily. Uh, okay, move on to the next one. What, what have you seen in the medical space? Um, we're a telehealth and at-home lab testing company. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. In the medical space, um, Google's being very cautious, of course. Um, I, I'm the person that I'm like a troll. Like I try to go onto SGE and get it to say dangerous things, medical things. Um, and it doesn't, yeah, most of the time, maybe one out of a thousand times it gets something really wrong. So I think they're being very, very careful. Um, in many cases, it'll just say an AI generated answer is not possible for this query. That's them protecting themselves. But, um, if they do provide SGE results, they're almost always going to try to source from like, you know, the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic and Harvard and, and, and the NIH and things like this. So. Um, you know, they, they like all things with Google, they're going to try to source from the most authoritative places. But um, like any other site or any other category, I would just take your most important queries and really try to pay attention day to day to what Google's doing in that category with SGE. Awesome. Uh, I'll keep moving through these with the still lots more coming through. So what are the top three most important? important touch points when working on SGA, SEO slash SGE now? I know you've given lots of tips, like um, if, if there were three that stood out, I guess. Yeah. Um, again, I, I would start with your brand just because that's the most, the easiest thing to control. So whether it's your brand or the people that work at your brand, or if you have a personal brand, like questions about yourself and pay attention to how those are being displayed. Um, for example, as when I started doing like SGE optimizations for my own self, my own personal brand, whatever, um, there is a character in the book called The Secret Life of Bees. Uh, her name's Lily and then her father is named T. Ray. So every time I typed Lily Ray, it thought that it was talking about that character in The Secret Life of Bees. And then when I would ask questions about Lily Ray's father, it would refer to that character's father, who is not a good person. So um, I don't want SGE to re convey that information about my dad, you know, incorrectly. So I think anything that has the potential to produce bad information about yourself or your brand, get ahead of it, go onto your sites, answer those questions very clearly, and then look into ways that you can corroborate that with third party links as well. Things like LinkedIn, things like X, Twitter, uh, your own, let's say, Medium, Substack, SoundCloud, all these things that you can control have consistent information in all those places because the, S the more you uh, encourage SGE to have a specific fact as truth from different places, the more likely you'll be to see that that fact. Awesome advice. That makes total sense. Um, okay, next one. Um, any... Uh, sorry, I lost my Q&A. Okay, I'm back. Is there any indication that the notes feature on a brand result might replace Google My Business notations? Mm, I don't think so. Um, I mean, right now, notes is only in beta, and um, you'll 
mostly only see it for like articles so far from what I've seen. So like um, maybe a news article or product reviews or things like this. And in fact, when you actually uh, click notes in many cases, it'll say notes are not available for this page. <laughs> I don't know why that's happening, but that's happening as well. Um, I've already seen people spamming notes. I think it's pretty obvious that that's what, how the internet would work. So I'm curious to see if this thing will ever become a live product. I'm skeptical. Thank you. Um, next one, a lot of anticipation and apprehension around, but would really like to know your opinion regarding how SEOs and SEO content writers as a whole could be impacted by the prevalence of AI in search. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's, it's a big, I don't want to say threat because I think that there's always potential to, um, still provide great content that people care about. I think there's one piece of relatively good news for human writers and content creators, which is the way that people are responding to um, when a brand gets, let's say, caught with AI-generated content. The perception is not good right now. Um, it's it's pretty clear that most people who see this in the news are up in arms. They're not happy. They're not impressed. Despite the fact that a lot of people love using AI and, and want to use AI, you know, for their own purposes, for their own websites or whatever, when people find out that brands are doing it, they don't like it. So I think it's right now, at least it's human nature to want authentic human generated content. So creating that personal brand, creating that personal voice and doubling down on that is something that I think users will continue to receive very well. And it's also clear that Google's trying to elevate that over time. So even though they're pretty clearly getting it wrong a lot of the time right now, it's still early. They need time to figure it out algorithmically. So just keep being true to yourself and your experience. Also, uh, time, time for at least one more, I think. Um, if you had a large B2B SEO slash content budget for 2024, what would you focus on most and why? Yes. Yeah, it's a hard one. Um, probably uh, like, like uh, producing first party data and research and um, investing in the quality of content that you use to present that research publicly. So if you were to do a study on something that's very interesting and very relevant to your brand, and that study were interesting enough to use some PR to get it in like, you know, New York Times or CNN or whatever, um, and you had a nice video to go along with it, you had a nice, you know, images and a really nice page to go along with it, that will pay for itself so much more than trying to write 50 different articles based on keyword search volumes that everybody's already written. So invest in quality and invest in original research as well. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I will pick out one more. Um, this might be tricky to answer. Is if you had to guess, when do you think roughly the SG will fully roll out? I guess that's a hard one to answer given that it could have happened at any time, right? You get a lot of different opinions about this in our space. Some people think it never will. Um, some people think that it's on the horizon and it's going to destroy SEO in the next three months. I, it's impossible to say. Uh, I think it's too dangerous and risky for Google to launch any time in the next three months, at least publicly. Okay, cool. Thank you. Actually, one follow-up from me as well. Uh, the fact that they've started referring to SG as, as an experiment internally, do you think that that's like uh, a sign that potentially they rolled this out earlier than they were ready to make it? Well, it's not rolled out publicly yet. Um, but yes, I do think that the word experiment was very important because uh, it's not a product that's on the near horizon. It's an experiment that they're still testing. Sure thing. Thank you. All right. Um, I think that we'll probably wrap it up now. Thank you so much for uh, answering all the questions. Uh, I know that was a lot of things that I could you, so they were awesome answers. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Lily. Thank you to everyone for all your questions and keeping this chat nice and lit. Um, I want to plug um, our next webinar, which is on January 10th. It's with a company called AB Tasty that we have recently um, integrated with, and they are fabulous. And you don't want to miss this one. And I added the, the link here. And we will have Lily's fantastic presentation up on YouTube in the next day or two. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And we are so looking forward to seeing you in 2024. This was our last um, webinar of the year. And thank you all for making these such a big success for all of us. And Lily, you are welcome to come back anytime. And thank you all and have a wonderful day. There you go.
Take care. See you all soon.